You're watching a special edition of the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. On this episode, we go back to the early years of the Blue Angels and get access to a never-before-released interview with World War II ace, Navy test pilot, and Blue Angel Edward Whitey Feitner. Responsible for establishing the F-7U Cutlass program on the Blue Angels in 1952, Feitner gives rare insight into the team's reformation after the Korean War and the unthinkable technical challenges they face throughout the airshow season. Feitner also provides details about the capabilities of the Cutlass and shares the tragic story of his final day on the Blue Angels, where the team suffered a fatal mid-air collision over NAS Corpus Christi. This rare interview was conducted over two and a half decades ago by aviation historian and author Nicholas Veronico, who has generously shared this incredible piece of history and joins us to kick things off. So please join me as we go back in time and welcome Nick Veronico to the podcast. And welcome back to another episode of the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. As you got teased in the introduction, this is a really special episode because uh, we got access to a very special tape in an interview with a former Blue Angel, Edward Whitey Feitner. He had a very brief tenure on the Blue Angels, but an eventful one. And I'm really looking forward to sharing this interview with you. And the man we owe the gratitude for getting access to this never heard before interview is joining us now. He's an aviation author, aviation historian, Nick Veronico. Nick, thank you so much for joining me. And more importantly, man, thank you so much for your generosity and sharing these tapes with me. Oh, my pleasure, Ryan. Thanks for having me. Of course. And so I should say, yeah, it's more than just this interview you shared with me. You've actually given me several tapes with some real Blue Angel legends, like the Founding Fathers, Butch Voris, Ray Hawkins, uh, Ken Wallace, uh, Bill Wheat, just to name a few. And so with your permission, I look forward over the, the next year of sharing that here on the Blue Angel Phantoms podcast. But we should say really where the origin of these tapes come from, and they come from your work on this incredible book, Blue Angels, a flyby history. It covers the first 60 years of the Blue Angels. And I have to say, since I started the work here on the Blue Angel Phantoms YouTube channel and podcast, I use your book as research for every interview I do. So I'm incredibly grateful for it, but would love to get some background. You know, why did you do the book? Uh, and, you know, like I said, it covered the first 60 years of the Blue Angels history. We have the 80th anniversary coming up in a couple years. Are we going to get an updated version? I hate putting you on the spot, but uh, I'd be a big fan if you if you didn't update. Yeah, I'd like to do that very much. Uh, the book came about, I worked, I uh, had a colleague, Marja Fritzi, who uh, was a fantastic writer. Uh, she and I did the 50th anniversary history. She then went on to have uh, other corporate successes and I, she was out of the picture, so I picked it up, uh, picked up the book, and updated it for the 60th anniversary. And my part uh, in the in the 50th anniversary is I wrote uh, up to the F-18s, and I was really honored and humbled to have so many of the early blues open up their homes and uh, just generously give me their time to to sit down and tell me stories and. Uh, I think every time I would leave one of their houses, I had to scrape my chin off the floor because the stories were just incredible. So I feel very fortunate, and uh, I'm looking forward to you sharing this material uh, with your audience. I think, uh, well, I should say I hope everyone enjoys it. Oh, I'm sure they will. Uh, so uh, let's talk about this. The first interview, Whitey Feitner. Uh, really revered amongst his peers, a uh, legend, but share with our audience just so they know who they're about to listen to. Who's Whitey Feitner? So Whitey Feitner was a uh, fighter pilot. He had a degree in chemistry and he went through the civilian pilot training corps and uh, got his pilot's license in uh, June of 1941. So he was designated a naval aviator in April of 42 and he went on to join VF-10 uh, as the assistant engineering officer. And he was in combat in the South Pacific on the Enterprise. Uh, he was also uh, on the Bunker Hill. He had nine aerial victories. And uh, he rotated back uh, stateside in November of 44. And he went on to be the engineering officer of VF-98. Um, and then gunnery officer of VF-21. So by 1948, you know, three years after the end of the war, he was uh, a test pilot at Pax River. And uh, one of the airplanes he was assigned was the Vought Cutlass F-7U. 
Uh, it was a radical airplane uh, back then and probably would be today. It was tailless uh, and it uh, twin engine. It sat uh, with a nose high attitude. Uh, so the pilot was about 12 feet off the ground uh, when the airplane was on the ground and the landing gear moved. Uh, it had a launch position and a landing position. Uh, so it was very complex. The other thing is it had an incredible roll rate. I, if I recall correctly, uh, Whitey had told me something like uh, over an average of five rolls. It had a almost a 600 degree roll rate per minute. Um, and one of the stories he talks about is uh, how he was able to compensate uh, doing rolls to keep the horizon uh, from moving and getting lost in his vision. Uh, so he was an incredible pilot. He flew the uh, Cutlass with the Blue Angels uh, for about nine months. And then he rotated back and was uh, commanding officer of VX-3, the development squadron at Pax River. And he went on to uh, a ship command, some shore commands, and he retired as a rear admiral in uh, 1974. Well, he's a real legend, uh, unfortunately passed away in 2020. So really blessed that you captured this interview that we can share it with this audience. And so we're going to head into the interview. I want to remind people that this, this was recorded almost two and a half decades ago, if not longer ago, uh, wasn't recorded in a podcast format. So we've cleaned up the audio and, uh, really looking forward to sharing it with you, but I want to encourage you to stick around for after this interview, because Nick is up to some incredible work right now. Uh, and I'm going to put a picture on the screen of this F-18 Hornet that you see out there in the desert of Yuma in the Boneyard. So just to tease you, so stick around for after the interview, you're going to want to hear what Nick's been up to, uh, with this latest work. So, uh, with, uh, let's kick into it. And, uh, here you go. Nick Veronico interviewing Whitey Feitner. Mr. Feitner, this is Nick Veronico. Yes, I was, sir. How are you? Very good. Good. You made it through the Million Man March? Yes. So so far, I've survived it. Great. <laughs> I wanted to talk to you for a couple minutes, if you got time, about uh, flying with the blues. All right. Uh, how did you get involved with the team? Well, this is a story that most people... Even the team didn't hear about most of them, I think. Even Butch Boris is not aware of it. But when uh, after um, the Korean War, where John Magda was killed, uh, you know, was the team leader. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, then the team came back and was disbanded, more or less, and because uh, they, got, they got sent off as a team out to the war out there. Um, I got a call. I was at Pax River as a test pilot. And I got a call and said that I had been selected to be the new team leader and that uh, we were going to fly F-7Us. Well, that took me about five minutes to get a hold of Mary and Carl, and uh, that airplane wasn't suitable for the thing. And so we w we came to Washington and finally convinced them that they, they could not fly the F-7U in the Blue Angel exhibition that was it wasn't a, a mature enough airplane, and the, co the control system wasn't adequate. And um, they had to, in order to save face, why they um, they said, well, why can't we use them in the solo act then? And I agreed that, yeah, they could do that. Both Mary and Carl and I both agreed that uh, it was suitable for that. And with that, we looked around, and we selected the F-9F-5 as the team airplane. Well, about... Four days later, they called up and said, you know, who, who are you going to get to fly this airplane in the, as a solo act? Because there weren't any F-7U pilots in the world. So I finally agreed that I would fly it as a solo, and we looked around to find, found out that Butch Boris was available. And so they re decided to recall him as a team leader. So we got, we found out that Butch was available, and he agreed to come back and uh, take the team for one season, and and uh, till they could uh, we get the team reorganized and going again. And so with that, why we got two airplanes, two F seven U's ready, and uh, in January they went down to Corpus Christi to become part of the team, and I got orders and went along with them. <laughs> and by that time, Butch. Uh, was just reporting in also. So that was January of 52? January of 52, right. Mm -hmm. 
Mm-hmm. And uh, Harding McKnight? Yeah, there, there wasn't anybody else. We had two airplanes and one pilot. And uh, I'd known an old Mac McKnight from before. And uh, we got a hold of him, and he, he agreed to come over and l- learn to fly the airplane. And, uh, of course, he would had team experience before. And so he had been, he was, uh, at this point, he was over in the training command, and he wasn't too happy about it. He was delighted to come over. And so uh, I got him orders to come over and uh, fly the other F-7U. And what, did, I take it these airplanes were at uh, Patuxent River when you got them? Oh no no no! They were at uh, these were new airplanes right out of the plant. Oh wow! Okay. And we configured them especially for the Blue Angels. You know, we left out things that they didn't really need, and uh, such as and all oh, the uh, a lot of the uh, the guns and the ammo cans and things like that. You know, that were just excess weight in the airplane. And then what uh, what type of demonstration did you fly with them? Well, as it turns out, uh, we got the, the airplanes down there, and I, I started getting McKnight checked out in them, and, and the F-9, F-5s got grounded, and we didn't have any airplanes. And so we put the team back in uh, in TV-2s, the Lockheed the Shooting Star, you know, type. Mm-hmm. The Navy version was the TV-2, a two-seat version. And uh, the, the first few shows... Uh, I put on the air show with the one F seven U. McKnight didn't have enough time to even fly in the shows, and uh, and the the um, the team flew people around in the in the TV twos. And in fact, one of the biggest demonstrations we had was at Pensacola, in which um, it was a sick nav cruise, which he had the, all of the top uh, in, industrial people, presidents, and so forth down there for. Uh, a, a cruise out on the uh, on the carrier, and we gave him an air show, or at least I gave him an air show while we were there. And then the, the team flew a lot. Those that wanted to fly, they put them in the back seat of the TVs and took them up for a, a little cruise around over the the Pensacola area. And we actually put on the air show out at Softly Field, and that turned out to be a spectacular event. Especially since uh, on the in takeoff, uh, of course, I had I had quite a bit of time in the airplane, and so we made an next performance takeoff, and I hit the afterburners. And uh, this this airplane, uh, before I get into that, one of the reasons we couldn't fly it in formation was this was the first airplane the Navy had that flew the uh, operational airplane that was hyd- had a hydraulic control system in it, and it was backed up by a mechanical system. And uh, the, the this hydraulic system wasn't all that uh, foolproof, and we used to lose it a lot. It would fail an awful lot of times, and when it did, it took 11 seconds before the c- mechanical control system took over, and you could control the airplane. That's a lifetime. This, this is three lifetimes, <laughs> believe me. <laughs> this, this is why uh, I have made the claim, and, and and I think it's probably still good today. I have more time, more passenger time, in single air, engine airplanes, <laughs> in, in single place airplanes, than any guy living. <laughs> I've spent a lot of time waiting on that 11 seconds to to expire. Anyhow, the. Uh, I, I made a, a takeoff and hit the afterburners and uh, and the, you know this thing this thing was a spectacular air show airplane you know, as, as long as you could fly it singly and uh, so I took off and this thing goes straight up and about just about the time that I, I passed about 200 feet going up I lost the control system and the airplane just sort of went ballistic you know and sort of arced up and at about oh maybe twelve or fifteen hundred feet, why it ran out of speed and the nose dropped through and you know I'm still unconnected. I'm just riding at this point. Never got high enough to actually eject because we didn't dare eject anywhere below a thousand feet because you wouldn't make it. So 
I'm just sta- sitting there watching the ground come up at me, and finally everything connected up, and the airplane did about a square turn, and uh, there's a little debate about whether the wheels actually touched the ground or not, but uh, at least it squared off and stopped. And uh, But by this time, I was so low that I couldn't get over the trees at the end of the field, and I carved a hole through them. Well, when I did that, it tore off the port slat, which went down the port engine, and I lost the port engine. And uh, this was a really gusty day, and which wasn't, you know, it was one of those things that I got the engine shut down all right, and the fire warning light went out. And so I came around and declared an, an emergency because the minute you put the landing gear down with a single engine on this bird, it was landing. And so I got around and they. They, they got the field cleared out for me, and I dropped the landing gear and got it on the ground. And uh, it was a little hairy, but it got on the ground all right. And, of course, I rolled up to, to the crowd standing there, and they got all the, everybody was very quiet. Everybody was waiting to see how I was going to get out of the airplane because there was no ladder. You know, this was you're sitting 12 feet off the ground, and uh, we had a series of little steps that opened up when you put the landing gear down. They watched me climb out of the airplane, and then the big cheer goes up. <laughs> About that time, Admiral Pride, uh, Admiral Price, rather, the tra- hit his training command at that time, I believe. Anyhow, he was in charge of the, of the air show, and he came over and congratulated me and all this thing. He said, you know, I really feel terrible about this, but will the other airplane fly? <laughs> So I immediately got in the other airplane and went up and finished putting on an air show for him. And where was this at? This was at Softly Field in Pensacola. And about what time frame? Oh, this was along about in uh, maybe March. March of 52. And, March. But, and then they, you kept flying them at, even after that, huh? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We flew a lot after that. Because the uh, we didn't get the F... Um, 9F5s really ungrounded until about July. And um, so the team, uh, you know, they, they did a lot of their practice in the... You, you know, I have to check this with Butch Forrest. I've forgotten how many... Um, uh, how many different... I, I think they flew, though, a lot of practice demonstrations in the... In the um, in the TVs before they actually got into the F nine F five, but we got the F we got one F F nine F five ungrounded. What was the problem with the dash fives? Engine problems. So what kind? Oh, they were just fuel control problems primarily. I think, mm-hmm. as I recall right now, I know we had a lot of trouble with them at Pax River and did stick that thing any number of times because the engine quit. In fact, uh, the first one was the one that Marion Carl broke his back in. He was chasing me, and uh, I was doing spins in the F-7U, and he was the chase plane, and he was flying the F-95, which was brand new at that time. And uh, in the middle of my second spin, he called and said, Oops, I just had a flame out. So I got on his wing, and we come down, and it was a really windy day at Pax River, and he... Uh, the, the tower said, oh, you're cleared to use the long runway at your discretion. And and he said, oh, never mind, I'll use the I'll use the duty runway, which was the short runway to the northeast when we went right by the tower. And so I would fly at his wing, and he was downwind on this thing. And uh, as he turned into final, I had to leave because he was getting so slow. And uh, so I pulled off away and... Boy, about that time I heard the tower screech, and I and I look around, and there sits Mary and Carl about 2,500 feet short of the runway, the airplane flat on the ground, and uh, no fire or anything. So when I landed, I found out and went over and asked him, uh, and they had him over in the dispensary, and I asked him what in the world happened. He said, well... I just tried to make it look too good. He said, I I was going to land on the end of the runway. And I pulled the nose up to slow it down. And he said, about that point, I felt the flaps come down. And our, our uh, minimum glide speed on that thing 
was, uh, well, maybe 160. Of course, he was going to slow it down the floor and that to, to land it. And this, the flaps in that airplane had a blow-up switch on them. And any any speed over about 140, why they they stayed retracted. But if you got slower than that, the flaps came down. And he said he realizes at the time what was happening to him, but uh, the flaps came down and the airplane just spun on him. And he had just you know, he, he was low enough at that point that uh, he hit on the starboard wing and the nose wheel and ricocheted back up in the air. And then he it started to roll left on him, and he hit on the left tank. And it just flattened the airplane out, and with that, he dropped about 40 feet, and it broke the back on the airplane, broke his back, but it, the engine was cold enough at that point that even though there was fuel all over the place, the airplane was completely full of fuel. He'd only been airborne about 20 minutes. He got away with it. But anyhow, that was the problem with the airplane, mm-hmm. at 5 at that point. And uh, so we had him down there. I guess they arrived along about, uh, oh, I guess, late January, early February. We had a little problem with them. Uh, used to get fire warning lights on them. Uh, Butch would be leading the team and uh, get up there and just get inverted, and uh fire warning light would come on and, and somebody. So they, at that point, they just decided they disconnected the fire warning lights. It would be better to... <laughs> not have something happen in the middle of those and it, and there are enough people watching them so that if they actually were on fire well, they wouldn't have a problem so and what type of maneuvers would you fly uh during the solo routine well uh the solo routine i put on a oh the airplane was a spectacular it's the only airplane that had the fastest rate of roll of any airplane we've ever had before or since in fact, I have one instrumented roll at Pax River during some of the tests there, in which I did an average over the five turns was 576 degrees per second. I've never seen a guy who could throw the stick over in that airplane and stop it upright. <laughs> so I, I used to use that feature in the, in the air shows and do, you know, do spectacular rolls and uh, and it had the best set of speed brakes on it any airplane ever invented. I think it had absolutely no trim change when you threw them out, and they stopped you like you, you just caught the arresting gear. You know, they would just, they would really slow you down. And so, after I got McKnight trained in that thing, we used to one of the, the the final features in the thing. We'd come at each other doing about 450 from opposite ends of the runway. Each one of us on the right side of the, of our own side of the runway and just as we passed each other we would throw out the speed brakes and hit the afterburner and we'd never cross the other end of the field we'd just do square turns and reverse and fly down past each other going the other way <laughs> you know there just didn't an airplane like that there <laughs> and the airplane uh, also would uh, i'd do these high rates of roll coming by in fact uh, one of the things that we really stopped this thing i had all of the um they had the southwestern conference of high school had all the kids there in the bleachers and so forth and it was a day when we had a ceiling that was maybe about uh, 800 feet i guess and anyhow they asked me if i could put on a show on it and so i agreed and so it was one of these Blue Norther days down in in Texas when it's absolutely clear underneath, but the clouds were really low, you know, down by. And so I put on a, a kind of a flat show doing turns and rolls and so forth. And as I came by, I had a maneuver which I had worked out, which I'd do full aileron rolls to the left. And because of the high rate of roll, um, are you familiar with this citrus? centrifugal thing where they put you in a chair and spin you and then tell you to look at a spot on the wall mm-hmm. and how, how the your eyes keep flickering on this. Well, at that high rate of speed, if you roll that thing more than a couple of turns, the horizon is, is, is flipping back and forth about 40 degrees and you can't, you, you never know what the horizon is. And I had found out that if I did about three turns to the left, and then reverse at a full throw going the other direction about three turns, it would counteract it and it would it would 
I would actually the horizon would be still for me. So I used to roll about three turns left and then three turns right and and go on off, fly on off the other way. Well, when I went into my three turns to the left, I was in the middle of that thing when a, a little light plane popped out of the overcast right ahead of me, and I was right in front of the grandstand at this point. Well, I shoved forward on the stick and up into the overcast and missed the guy somehow. They tell me it turned it turned that little light plane completely over with, with the turbulence when I went went so close to him anyhow. It tore off the doors on my landing gear. Uh, it had overstressed the airplane so much that that negative G on there. And big pieces of this thing went all through the crowd because I was rolling at the time, you know, and it threw those pieces out. Some of them even went over to stand. Fortunately, nobody got hurt. They picked up some pieces about the size of your fist, you know, that came off of the airplane. It was one of those thin cloud things that was only about 200 feet thick, and I boomed out on top of that. And, and uh, it did uh, it did tear off one of the slats, and again, I lost an engine on that thing and had to go back to it. But that's the sort of a thing we kept running into. And the thing was a maintenance nightmare, of course. It was a, that hydraulic system was a poor old Bob Belt, the, uh, the maintenance officer, used to just tear his hair on this thing, and in the middle of uh, our getting ready for the season, the Navy decided to change from uh, hydraulic fluid, red hydraulic fluid, to a thing called hydrol, which was a non-flammable type of fluid. They forgot to stress how much they had to flush out the system, and this uh, just formed all kinds of gunk in there. The, two, the little bit of hydraulic fluid that was left mixed with that hydrol and just made a kind of a gunk. So we had to completely strip the hydraulic system on the airplane and reinstall it, you know. And so it did cause a lot of consternation around there. What was the deciding factor to get rid of the uh, the cutlass? Well, uh, because because of these things we had, uh, you know, I uh, that plus an incident in which I lost all the electrical things in the airplane was up above an overcast and actually had to make a GCA with zero instruments, you know, and uh, fortunately the airplane was a nice stable airplane and I'd flown it enough that uh, I knew the airplane would stay upright and so I, I managed to get through the clouds with this thing with G on a GCA vectoring mirror back and around and, and got the thing on the ground. But, uh, you know, it was a pretty hairy airplane. The two of you had put on a number of air shows in the, the Dash. Yeah, along with Buddy Rich, who was flying the F-9F-5. We had, we had one F-9F-5 in existence. And I guess that, we did that between about March and June, that time that the F-9F-5s got ungrounded. Uh, enough so that they were practicing with them, but they weren't ready to put on a show. When we got a request to, to go to the opening of the, New Pittsburgh Airport, and they were going to have some Pax River airplanes up there and so forth. So uh, McKnight and I started off. I guess we went by way of St. Louis to get refueled because it was a pretty short-range airplane. We we left there, and uh, McKnight had a hydraulic problem and had to drop out over Columbus, Ohio, and I went on to Pittsburgh. And Mac arrived about the next day. He got the hydraulic thing fixed and we had a more or less a one flyover and a static display the rest of the time for the airport up there we put on uh, a little bit of a show up there but we had one problem and had to have an engine flown in and we changed and it wanted the engines in the f7u at that point but the day we were we were to go on then from there to glenview and it, it was raining in the morning we took off, and I lost an engine on right shortly after takeoff when we were climbing up the overcast. But with a single engine on that thing, I wasn't about to go back in and make an instrument approach there, and so we headed on for Glenview. And I got over Glenview and told them my situation, told them that uh, I was declaring a deferred emergency because 
But uh, once I put the landing gear down, I had to land. And we came across the airport at about 1,500 feet, doing about maybe 300. And uh, about right over the center of the field, McKnight says, hey, I have a fire warning light on the right engine. He says, whoops, there goes the left one. And I turned around to see what was happening. And I said, hang on, and the minute we're over the water, you eject. About that time, I looked around, McKnight is inverted, flaming like mad, and hit it down. And he actually split us that airplane from 1,500 feet. There is no other jet in the world you could split us from 1,500 feet that I know of. Anyhow, he, he got away with it. And uh, I caught up with him just as he was going over the fence onto the airport and had him blow the gear down. We had a, an air bottle that would blow the gear right through the gear doors. and he, So he blew the gear down. And he's it, really flaming. There was, the tower was screaming at him and all that. But at that point, just as the main gear touched down, I saw the the nose gear come out and and lock. And the minute the nose gear hit the runway, McKnight went over the side, <laughs> parachuting all. He went out the left side of that airplane, and that's you know, that's 12 feet in the air and doing about 80 knots at that point some reason, the, the wheel didn't run over him, but he rolled off of that wing and out across the tarmac, and the airplane went out and did about a half ground loop and stopped, and the fire crew came out and put out the fire. With that, my, we had to take a good look at the airplane, but I took the uh, R5C and went down and picked up a bunch of the of the, air, uh, the, uh, the Vought crew and four new engines for the airplanes, and and we headed back for Glenview, and, uh, no, but not without a little bit of a mishap. I, I was climbing out of uh, out of Dallas, and at 9,000 feet, both engines on that R5C jet. Oh, no. And, uh, I had a chief in there with me, and uh, uh, chief AP, and... Uh, so I had him get everybody into their parachute harness because we couldn't get any fuel pressure. We had absolutely zero fuel pressure and couldn't get any more. So that we turned around and we're headed back toward Dallas and we decided we'd get out at 5,000 feet to see if everybody was in their harness. And about that point, I was getting into my... The chief had was flying the airplane and I got into the, my harness and he says... Commander, look over the nose. I can see the steel from here. We can make that. And I looked, and sure enough, that wind had really blown us back toward the airport. So with that, I made a decision. I told them to tell the guys that anybody who wanted to jump could jump, but I was going to take the airplane in and try to land it. Thing. And I gave the chief the same option, and uh, he, he went back and talked to me a little bit. He came back and said, everybody's going to stick with us. <laughs> So we we did stick it into in the, in the uh, Dallas, ran you know downwind with that much wind. It took us. We ran clear out to the middle of the lake there on the runway. The runway goes out in the lake. Anyhow, got to stop. Took them about uh, ten minutes to find out that somebody hadn't tightened the clamp on the main fuel line and the big three and a half inch line, and it had just fallen off. So they fixed that, and we were ready to go and. Uh, I went in to file a flight plan and told the chief to get the crew loaded, and we'd be going in a little bit. Came back and he said, those guys are over at Love Field. They're going to take the airliner up <laughs> to Chicago. <laughs> so the chief and I flew the thing back. And, but anyhow, we got a, we got the, up to uh, Glenview. We, we found out that we actually could fix the airplanes, and uh, the Vought guys... The fire hadn't really done that much damage. It was just fuel burning, prime fuel and hydraulic fluid that was burning primarily, and uh, it really hadn't damaged the airplane that much. There was just a little sheet metal work that had to be done. And so we fixed the airplanes up, and sure enough, they were ready to go. Well, I decided I would take the the repaired airplane, and I put Mac in the airplane I'd been flying. And... Uh, it only had one new engine in, so Mac took it up to break in the, the new engine on the test flight. Got up there, and this airplane had a peculiar feature. 
the the main gear, you put it in one position for takeoff. You had to shift it forward about 18 inches, and uh, for the takeoff, so you'd have enough elevator power to lift the nose wheel off. And for landing, the gear was actually back that 18 inches, and uh, did it the main gear test down when the nose wheel came down, and you you couldn't if you didn't have enough until you got well over 150 knots, you didn't have enough speed to pick the nose wheel off again. So anyhow, so we had this two-position landing gear on there. In fact, uh, when I took it out of board ship the first time, they had it sitting in the chocks, and the, the gear was in the landing position, of course. Uh, and uh, I got ready for takeoff, and and when I put the gear in the, the forward position for takeoff, because the wheels couldn't move there in chalk, the whole airplane reared back and it sat on its tail for a minute. You know, the crew ran like mad because nobody warned them about this. <laughs> so, you know, it was pretty spectacular, really, to see it happen. But we did that every flight. So we always put it in the takeoff position for takeoff, and then when you put it down to land, it came down in the landing position. To make a long story short, McKnight goes up on his flight. He put the gear handle down. One of them went to the landing position, the other stayed in the in the forward position, <laughs> and he had a nose gear. And when I when I they got a hold of me, told me what his that he was having a problem. He couldn't tell whether his gear was down or locked. I ran out on the field, and there was a marine taxiing out in an and a Bearcat, an F eight F, and I. <laughs> jumped on the wing and convinced him to get out and give me his airplane, which he did. <laughs> I, never, I never found the guy to thank him since, but anyhow, he got out, I climbed in the airplane, went up and found out, and I looked at the airplane, and I, by flying up underneath, I could see that both gear were locked. So I gave McKnight the, the option. He could either try to land it that way or bail out. Nobody would ever landed one like that before, but he opted to land it, and... It worked like a charm. <laughs> we we drop checked it, got the airplane, and the other one I test topped it. It turned out all right. So we we headed for Memphis. We were going to meet the team there for the first show. The F ninety five were ready to go. So we flew on down to got to get near to Memphis, and McKnight started losing hydraulic fluid. So I finally could see it just was pouring out of his airplane. And it shifted over, and he was, by this time, he was on the mechanical system. So we got an emergency declared. He landed on the runway, and there was just one big sheet of hydraulic fluid behind him on there. On the, and, and so I landed shortly thereafter, and we had a little conference and decided that Bob Belt just gave up on the airplane. He just said, uh, I, I can't maintain them anymore. So we gave them up and gave them to, to the uh, training center at Memphis, and they used them as test beds for all of their mechs and things that came through from then on. They never left there. By that time, Pax River wanted me back to uh, to check on the to fly the F7U3. Now these were F7U1s, and by now they had the F7U3 ready to go and. Uh, since I was the only one that ever flown an F7U3 aboard, they wanted me to come back and I mean the F7U experience aboard ship. Why they had me come back to take the F7U3 aboard? So the day I was detaching, we're on the sea uh, uh, plane ramp uh, down at uh, Corpus Christi, and, and this was a gusty day. And uh, but the <clears throat> the team was putting on their show in uh, F9. This is their first show in the Dash 5s? Uh, right. Well, no, they, they had actually put a show on in Memphis. Okay, so they're, they're second. Now we got all the midshipmen down there. This is the midshipmen show that they, they brought them in on the Constitution, and it, uh, they were all out there on the ramp. And uh, Butch Forrest was leading the team. Let's see, we had uh, Pat Murphy on one wing, Ray Hawkins on the other one, and... Uh, wood, I guess it was. And, and what were you doing? Uh, I was uh, uh, getting ready to detach, and I was just uh, talking on the radio down there. 
like uh, well, being you know, interviewed? We, we had an announcer was telling the crowd what was going on. Okay. And I was there with him helping out on that part of it. Okay. And uh, so, and we always had one guy who was in contact with the team all the time on a team frequency. Mm-hmm. And that that was me that particular time. And uh, and they they would tell me, you know, Butch would say where he was and was coming in, what his next maneuver is going to be, and so we we passed that on to the guy on the radio. Anyhow, they came around and uh, they were in a diamond formation and making a, a high speed left turn, you know, kind of a high speed pass where they made it slows down and and of course we never fly over the crowd, so they. So they made this high-speed pass, and I guess they, the bottom of the pass was probably about uh, oh, 1,500 feet, I guess. Just as they started pulling out of that thing, pieces started flying. All four airplanes came together. The, the, uh, it took off Ray Haw- Hawkins' uh, starboard tip tank. He was on the left wing. Uh, took off the elevator off of Butch's airplane. Um, the the port elevator and and stabilizer. It uh, took off the uh, the you know, Pat Murphy's port. He's on the right the port or starboard wing, and took off his port tip tank. You know they were really tucked in there. And when it took off, when when Ray Hawkins' tank hit that port stabilizer. We had a horn balance on the elevator, which when you're pulling out, the elevator is up, but this horn balance that sticks out in front is down below the elevator, and apparently that's where the contact was made. Well, immediately when when uh, that came off, it pitched Butch's no- nose down, airplane nose down. He was headed for the water when... When the number four man, which was Bud Wood, uh, hit him from the bottom, and it hit so hard it took the nose completely off of the, the slot man, Bud Wood's airplane, clear back to the firewall, and it bent Butch's tail forward, and Butch and uh, Bud Wood's nose slid off and went through the starboard elevator, and as it did so, it pulled Butch out of his dive. And we had some spectacular pictures of that, which in one frame, he went from 15 nose down to about 20 degrees nose, nose up on a high-speed film. Now, you know, that's pretty sudden. Mm-hmm. And uh, so anyhow, it pulled Butch out of the dive. Uh, Bud Wood went, I mean, uh, yeah, Bud Wood without that nose on there. Uh, and, of course, he you know, probably was pulling back on the sticks this time. It went straight up in the air, and of course it stalled, and he ejected at that point. And unfortunately, he never got out of the seat. We they had a picture for a while there of him sitting in the seat with the parachute on the drug chute on the thing, and he just went into the bay right in front of that whole crowd, and including his wife. Mm. And uh, the Pat and and. And um, Pat Murphy and uh, Ray Hawkins both managed to keep their airplanes flying. Uh, they'd lost, really, the main damage to their airplanes was they'd lost their tip tanks on the, on their inboard wing on that car. But Butch was in real trouble. And he had no down elevator now. It, it had broken the cable on the thing. He was unable to get the canopy open. He couldn't bail out, and in those days, you couldn't eject through the canopy. So he was sort of stuck, and he was going to have to put that airplane down someplace. And so uh, I got a, got on the horn with uh, the tower, and then they cleared him. We decided we'd send him over to Kingsville to land, because he had a nice long runway. And in the meantime, I talked to Butch on the radio and they found out he had no down elevator on that thing and and we I got him talking to him enough that we could find out that he could get it slow enough that he could actually put it on the runway uh, with power and uh, since he couldn't get out he had no other choice he had to do it so we had him leave the landing gear up and just to go over there to 
to Kingsville where they had a crash crew and everything and they had room enough for it. And he put that thing in very gingerly down on the runway doing about 160 and the, the thing skipped off but he didn't have any down elevator and so he just had to ride it until it settled down again. But fortunately it fell down, came to a stop and didn't burn and they had to cut him out of the cockpit. So you, you might have you talked to him about this? Uh, now that you mention it, I believe I have. Yeah. Now, that was a gear-up landing? It was a gear-up landing. Hmm. Wow. I, uh, gosh, now, and now that I come to you raise the question, I've forgotten now whether he got the gear down or not. Hmm. I think it was a gear-up landing, but I, it may not have been. Now, didn't... Long ago, I can't remember. Didn't Ray Hawkins have to jump, uh, bail out of... Uh, a cougar later on? Yeah, when when Ray had the team later on, now he was, he went back to the factory to pick up the first F nine F six, and uh, he was doing just great with that thing when the tail ran away with him. You know, it had this uh, a full flying tail on it, and he had an electrical malfunction of some kind that <laughs> put that thing in a hard nose up, and it, and uh, he had to bail out of the thing. Hmm. When he got out, he was. Well, I guess he went nose down, yeah, really. And he had to get out of it supersonically. He had to get out above oxygen altitude, and it tore his mask away, and he had to survive on grunt breathing, you know, with your, where you just pressurize your lungs, you know, with your with your muscles. And that, that's the way he survived that one. But that's the saga of the F-7 News, and most people, most of the time, None of the histories ever even mentioned the F-7U. They were so... So what an incredible interview. It's uh, just a different world back then with that cutlass uh, and the reliability issues that he had to deal with. Just insane stories. But uh, Nick, as I uh, said at the beginning of the interview, you're working on some pretty impressive work right now. So wanted you to share a little bit about some of the projects you've been working on over the last uh, year or two here that are pretty exciting. Thanks, I uh, finished a book on the military aircraft boneyard uh, known as AMARG, A-M-A-R-G, at Tucson. Uh, They store right now about 3,500 aircraft. Uh, The Blue Angels F-18, when they retired the legacy airplanes, uh, those that didn't go to various memorials or museums went to the boneyard. And uh, Blue Angel number two that you saw is now at the Castle Air Museum in Atwater, California. And uh, the Castle guys trucked it up from uh, Tucson to Central California. They refreshed it, uh, did a little bit of restoration, and it's now on display, and it looks fantastic. And I just came out uh, with a book with my friend Jim Dunn on Navy colors at Fallon called High Desert Deployment. And the forward's by uh, Gil Rudd, Duster. So that uh, will be uh, in stores pretty soon. And right now I'm finishing another book on looking for historic aircraft crash sites and the history behind those airplanes. So lots of fun stuff happening. Yeah, your books are incredible. Uh, Several of them sit on my bookshelf, which I'm thrilled about. And uh, can't, uh, again, express my appreciation enough for your generosity in sharing this material with me. Looking forward to picking up some of your new books. And uh, we'll play some of your interviews uh, as the year progresses here with some of the other legends. So hopefully I can get you to come back for those. And in the meantime, thanks again, Nick. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it.